David, and thanks to the America Future Series for uh, bringing us all here today. So welcome. I'm Robert Hastings, and it's my pleasure today to moderate this distinguished panel comprised of several of our nation's most experienced, informed, and respected leaders on the subject of artificial intelligence in national security. Uh, formerly, the subject of our discussion is AI for national security and defense, keeping our competitive edge. Joining me on this panel today is Secretary Michael Chertoff, former Secretary of Homeland Security and Executive Chairman of the Chertoff Group. General retired Keith Alexander, former Director of the NSA and the first Commander of the U.S. Cyber Command, presently Founder and Chairman of IronNet. And General retired Kim Kreider, former Chief Technology and Innovation Officer for the U.S. Space Force, now founding partner of Alera Nova, the Space Consultancy. I'm sure everyone joining us today is is as excited as I am to hear your thoughts on this important and timely subject. So let's just jump right in. Uh, I'm gonna start with a question for everybody and we'll just go around the clock. So um, artificial intelligence is many things to many people. So for our audience today, I'd like to ask each of you to share your broad perspective on what is AI and how can it be used for good or for ill? So for all of us, um, Kim, why don't you lead us on that response? Sure, happy to happy to uh, kick us off here, and thank you so much, uh, Bob, for having me on this uh, panel with uh, my illustrious panel mates. It really is a pleasure to be here, and thank you, America Future Series. So, what is AI? This is a topic that you know I think it's important for us to to start off with, just so we can kind of maybe level the playing field. We talk a lot about it. AI has certainly taken off in the public uh, space recently, and so when I think about what is AI, I mean to me it really comes down to a, a set of uh, technologies uh, that fundamentally act as aids, you know, cognitive aids. Uh, machines that can perform uh, cognitive functions that humans would typically perform, the ability to perceive, the ability to reason, the ability to decide or interact uh, or even problem solve and, and or emulate uh, and take action. We see with robotic uh, capabilities that are enabled by AI and autonomous systems. So, you know, I think that artificial intelligence is, is many things. It's not just one thing. We, we tend to think of it today specifically is, you know, generative AI, which is really just one aspect of what machines can do if they have this kind of cognitive ability built into them. And of course, to have that kind of ability, you've got to have data, you've got to have hardware and software uh, kind of all working together. Uh, so it's it's really a, a, a constellation of things. And as we get into it today, I think we're going to talk about you know, how humans too factor into the AI equation. But AI to me is, is a set of cognitive aids. Now, how can it be used for, for good or for ill? Well, you know, certainly, uh, you know, the ability, uh, and I love what the National Security Commission report on AI said, uh, the ability of a machine to perceive, evaluate, and act uh, more quickly and more accurately than a human represent competitive advantage. You think about it, it represents competitive advantage and that's in any field, flat out. You can think about if you can get machines to compute and reason and problem solve uh, on large sets of data faster than humans could in very dangerous or remote places, you could certainly create an advantage. And that, and I think that encapsulates you know, a lot of what AI can do. We see AI being incorporated into every aspect of human life and the human experience uh, because it can do those sorts of things. Uh, it can create uh, experiences uh, by, the, by the fact it can work together. Of course, that can be used in a, in a negative way as well. AI can be used against itself. Uh, AI can be used to create misinformation. Uh, AI can be used to, um, you know, create deep fakes. You know, we've seen some of that play out in the public sphere. Uh, so AI can certainly uh, lead to catastrophic effects because of how much we rely on information and the outcomes of processed information uh, and what that processed information can do, again, in creating experience uh, and how we interpret those experiences. So we're going to get into this today. It'll be really interesting to see where we go. Uh, let me turn it back over to you, Bob, to, to see what our other panel members want to say mm -hmm. about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Secretary Chertoff, why don't you grab the mic? 
Uh, thanks, Bob. And, you know, a very interesting topic of conversation, Kim. I think you've made some very good points. I'm tempted to say when I think of artificial intelligence, I visualize Arnold Schwarzenegger. But obviously, it's, it's more complicated than that. And I think actually, it's a rubric that covers a lot of different things. Um, at some level, it can be the ability to emula uh, emulate and simulate uh, a human face or a human voice in a way that's essentially undetectable. <clears throat> that gives us deep fakes or, or chat box or things of that sort. It can also be a way of sorting through huge amounts of data, but with generative learning, it can actually be the ability of the computer to derive from that mountain of data certain essential takeaways or um, underlying themes that can then actually be treated as the process of learning. And so um, it can be helpful, both in terms of assimilating large amounts of data and also in terms of recommending, and I'm gonna underline recommending to human beings, courses of action that might be taken based on the ability to assimilate and analyze data at much greater speed than a human being can do. Now, the reason I underline advise is because I do think if you get into more action events, the question becomes, when does there need to be a human in the loop? Because as we've seen, AI can also really present us with some howlers. Uh, you can have biases <clears throat> that are embedded in, for example, there was a famous story of a large company that was using AI to rank candidates for jobs and they were all white men. And they right. realized, oh, that's because <clears throat> AI went back historically and that was their database. Or there's a now notorious story of the lawyer who had AI write a brief for him, never bothered to check that the cases were in fact all made up. And he's now got to deal with a very angry judge. So, I mean, there are some limits to this, but there's some also real potential. Yes, that's a very famous case with the Microsoft um, hiring thing there. Um, General Alexander, what are your thoughts? Well, Bob, thanks for being here. And David, thanks for inviting all of us. And I agree with Secretary Chertoff and uh, Kim on what they said. I'd, I'd shape it in this way. First, I do think it's uh, creating a machine that can mimic the cognitive functions that we associate with human behavior. So when I think of that, think of it as, as growing a person with unlimited uh, capacity to uh, draw in data and give out answers. And so the consequence of that is good, is when you grow up a person and you train them one way, they'll act one way. If we train the machine one way, it will act one way. So Kim's comments about fakes, bad data, uh, and issues are things that we will face. We wrestled with this in the development of uh, U.S. Cyber Command with both administrations when I was in. And the issue that we had was AI is going to be used for offensive operations in cyber. AI is also going to be used and has to be used, therefore, for defensive operations in cyber. And the speed of that will pick up. I think the issue that we have to be concerned about, which ironically is the same things we wrestle with today, is truth. Many people see different versions of truth. Curating the data that we have for these AI machines is going to be one of the most important functions that we can do. I think that's that's the first thing I put on the table, making sure that the data that it starts with doesn't include data that we scraped off the net, which could have all sorts of random things. You, you, you look for anything on the net and you'll find anything on the net. And, and it's not true. So I think the biggest issue that I have with AI is how we ensure that the AI systems that we create, both for generative and for uh, military use, has data that is correct, curated, and abides with our culture, integrity, and rule of law. That's going to be a tougher, a tougher set of issues. And we can't stop. I've had people and heard people say, we should stop, outlaw AI. You can outlaw AI, it's not going to stop it. That's part one. Two, AI is really, really 
expensive to create foundational models that are of the size and scale we need to mimic a human mind. Big corporations are going to have to be involved in helping us get there. And three, I would just go back to our initial thing. We've got to ensure that it follows all the things that we would want to bring up this machine into our lives and mimic our, our future values. I think that's the part that we have to wrestle with. Great. Well, those, those are all very um, encompassing definitions there. I, and I think this is uh, it lays a great foundation for our discussion today. So General Alexander, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with you for this next one, because I think you sort of led into it. So how is the relationship between AI and intelligence in particular evolving? And how do you see the this rapid advance of generative AI affecting intelligence operations? Again, to, to use the term that, that Kim brought up, either for good or for ill. Yeah, so this will be, I think, a key element of warfare in the future. Uh, there's nothing that we can do to stop it. And if you look at what's going on in Ukra Ukraine today, we can step back and say, imagine if the following sets of things occurred. First, for intelligence, as, as you put on the table, what if we could map out the entire adversary tactical formations accurately and timely? That gives you a targeting table that's unprecedented. The second part is, what if we created a series of drones all connected to an AI platform for targeting and for evading it? All, all something that we could do. You can see that there was a great uh, drone set up where they showed the drone mimicking different figures of light. You could do that in tactical formations as well. Third, what if we used... AI in cyber to impact the adversary's ability to communicate and talk with their weapons platforms. I think we're going to see those three basic things happen in the next time we use warfare, what's upcoming. And that, that should stop all of us and say, okay, so what does that mean for our future? It means that we have to be very good at AI. We have to look at the rule of law. I would point out not everybody abides by our rule of law. So that's that's an issue for the United Nations and others. But when you talk about who you target, what you target, and how you target, I think those are, are issues that we have to do. And three, and perhaps most important, in cyber, the military is not the only target. It's our energy, our IT sector, all the rest of government, and uh, critical infrastructure for delivering goods and everything, that whole infrastructure is what the adversary would go after. And you can go all the way back to Clausewitz and these folks. I didn't, I never met him, so no, I, but I heard about Clausewitz. And if you look at the military stuff that started out there, they're going to say it's getting the nation to give up the will to fight. What if all of that attacked us? Would we have the will to continue? And I think we're going to see worse, not better, in the future, especially with all these things in AI. So I am concerned that we can use it for good. I think of cancer research, the ability to detect all the things that we can do with coming up with all these solutions. But it will also be used for bad and for warfare in a very serious way. And I think we're going to see some of those. And, and ironically, Secretary Chertoff brought up Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator. You know, we're getting very close to that, that vision. And I do think we have to figure out and make sure that the AI models that we create are founded on the principles and values that we have. So I'll pause there, Bob. Yeah, and I think even without looking at unethical uses of AI, you, you talked about um, uh, uh, operations on the battlefield, like being able to target, lay out an entire enemy formation with some level of accuracy that we've never had before. AI could also generate deception at a level we've never seen before and, and put an array in front of you that may not actually be there. So there's there's a lot of questions to that, exactly. Um, so Secretary Chertoff, um, following on the, the comments about um, sort of a human in the loop, an operator in the loop. So General Rainey, of uh, Futures Command 
recently spoke about integrating soldiers and machines together rather than one to replace the other. So the integration of the machines and soldiers kind of raises both ethical and operational challenges. What are your thoughts on some of the key considerations that decision makers ought to have running through their mind when we talk about integrating humans and machines together in the loop together? Well, first, uh, let me just <clears throat> come back to two points uh, General Alexander made. One is in terms of the vision of how you might use artificial intelligence on the battlefield to target enemy formations after you've mapped the entirety of what the enemy's force is doing. I would add to that, imagine that your AI, having studied you know, 20 years of tactical and training activities by your adversary, can predict which formations are likely to be imminently po you know, posed to attack so you can prioritize based upon this encyclopedic vision of the way the adversary deploys using that against all the data that's being detected on the battlefield. So it could be a real battlefield advantage. On the negative side, um, it's quite right that the will to fight and the unity of effort is often a major target of an adversary. And that's what disinformation is about. <clears throat> what it's designed to do is to sap the will to fight on the part of your adversary. And we're seeing that now. The Russians use disinformation to interfere with elections, to make us uh, decide we don't want to help Ukraine. All of these are ways of taking the battle into the area of your mind and not your air, land, and sea domains, because the mind is now a domain of, of, of battle as well. So in terms of the issue of melding a human being and, um, and a machine, um, you know, without being overdramatic, I think if what we're talking about is enhanced ability to visualize things, to hear things, to perceive things, to calculate, I mean, I think those are all things that are, are we have already to some degree and will simply be increased. However, what I would not want to see is ceding to the machine the decision-making ability about when to, to use a kind of a colloquialism, when to pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. And my view of, of AI, I, I've kind of conjured up the idea of three Ds that we should require for AI. One is data, which is General Alexander has said, making sure the data that it's fed is unbiased, accurate, and not invading privacy. The second is disclosure. If you're producing a product of artificial intelligence, a book, a movie, whatever, you should say this was produced in part by artificial intelligence. And the third DB, decision making. You know, if you're talking about uh, a decision that could affect a person's life, to me, a human being has to have the final say. So if you integrate the human being and the artificial intelligence, it's great to give the human the benefit of the learning and the information and the analytical work of artificial intelligence. But you don't want to cede to that the decision about when to pull the trigger. Absolutely. I think that becomes in the end, probably the big question that a lot of people have is how far do we let this AI model then go actually make decisions and, and take actions without humans? Um, so on the subject of autonomous systems, which that leads us right to, and if we can come back to you, uh, General Kreider, a lot being said about AI and autonomous systems for defense applications. Um, could you provide some insights into the current state of development and deployment, both of those, on autonomous AI systems and defense? And what are the you know challenges we need to, to look out for as we deploy those? Yeah, it's a really important topic, Bob, uh, and, and one that very much picks up on the comment that uh, General Alexander and Secretary Shertoff just made. Um, you know, we've been, there have been autonomous systems in the US military for a long time now. Uh, you know, and the DOD has had a directive, uh, DOD Directive 3000.09, uh, that's been out since 2012, uh, talking about autonomy in weapon systems and, and how uh, kind of providing some guidance and, and some policy on the development and use of autonomous and semi-autonomous uh, functions in uh, 
weapon systems for warfighting. That particular directive has just recently been updated in January of this year. Again, recognizing uh, the importance of AI, the proliferation of AI, the more that we see AI is going to be incorporated. In fact, Secretary Hicks has called for uh, the increase in the production of autonomous systems. And we know that many of these autonomous systems are gonna be more and more uh, enabled by artificial intelligence technologies and the things that we've just talked about. So what are the things that we need to worry about and, and, and address? Well, certainly uh, to the points that were made earlier, you know, these autonomous weapon systems that are AI enabled, the, the AI algorithms are trained by data need to make sure that we understand and can verify and validate that these models uh, are reliable and that they work in accordance to how they were designed and that the data that's being fed to them is good, well curated data, that those, that those models are, are well trained. But when those models are developed and they're trained to perform certain functions, uh, what they're trained to do in the laboratory uh, or in their development phase may be slightly different than what they're going to do in actual employment. So the need for operational experimentation, the need for operational test, uh, continuous validation and verification against operational, real live operational use cases with real live operational data, which is also changing and dynamic, uh, is really important too. That entire system with its data and all of its software obviously uh, needs to be protected from uh, cybersecurity risk and some of the things that we touched on earlier, uh, potential for that AI, for the models or the data to be hacked, for the data to be poisoned. Uh, how do you monitor for that? How do you uh, evaluate that your models are going to stay reliable uh, in, in the light of continuous you know, cybersecurity threats that are out there? Uh, these are things that we're going to have to be very clear on. Uh, so the whole end-to-end -end process of how we build and deploy and employ autonomous systems now in light of the fact that more and more there's going to be uh, thinking capability inside these systems fed by data uh, that will cause these systems to take certain action is going to be critical. To Secretary Shertoff's point, we absolutely have to have a very strategic view of what exactly these systems are going to do, where is the human in the loop, uh, and how, how does the human decision maker interact with these systems as well? So the trust that we uh, have in the systems, the way the human machine teaming occurs uh, is also another piece of it that has to be thought through the entire process of design, development, tests, and employment uh, so that we do ultimately have the case where, especially, certainly in situations of you know, life or death outcomes, uh, there is a human decision maker that that is making the decision. But again, going backwards from that human decision maker, what inputs, what influences, what uh, outcomes of other systems that may be AI fed is going to feed that decision maker? Uh, professional judgment uh, and expertise is always going to have to be a factor here. Uh, we have to be very thoughtful and very careful uh, as we develop these systems. Uh, and as we deploy them uh, to be thinking through the process of safeguarding them, uh, testing and, ver and validating them, building them out with uh, warfighters and operators in the loop and doing that on a very iterative and continuous way uh, as in a very deliberate uh, manner so that we can stay ahead of the threat, but we can also uh, avoid some of the compromises and challenges that we see. It's, a, it's a, a little bit like General Alexander early on, you talked about growing a human that has um, now a, a set of capabilities and, and some level of intelligence and data and it makes decisions. And then how do, you, how do you trust that that human you're growing hasn't had all these other outside influences? Almost like you worry about your, your teenagers, that you've given them the family values, but you don't know what's coming through their social media every night that's changing the way they think about that. That's absolutely right. You know, and again, just like interacting with a with a person, uh, there are different experiences. There's there's different influences uh, that they face depending on how much they can, how many sensors that they have, or how much data that they can be fed. Uh, and AI is a is a capability that, to some extent, is going to continue to grow and expand depending on 
how it's employed. So it's not a one and done. It's not just put it out there and, and see how it operates. Uh, it's something that we're going to have to continuously monitor, mon monitor, measure uh, the effectiveness of its outcomes uh, and assure its reliability, its security, uh, its, its explainability and its accountability for the outcomes that we're putting it uh, forward to achieve. Exactly. Um, so General Alexander, um, cyber security. Uh, we've talked about cybersecurity a couple of times. Cyber command comes to mind. So what, what are some effective ways, uh, in your opinion, that AI can be employed to facilitate cybersecurity? And maybe not just in defense, but across government and maybe even on the industry side, too, if you have any thoughts there as well. Yeah, let me pick up from what Kim was saying. Uh, so this sounds really well rehearsed. And that is, if you think about the data, the first thing that we have to do is let's say that each of the machines that we're going to create have some set of basic data and then advanced data to do their specific function. We have to rest assured that the data has not been compromised to do something wrong. So you see that today in many of the banking and other things that we do at, at a lower level. Now we're going to have to do that by having values, encryption, and other things that go to protect the data that the machine has been trained to use. So cybersecurity is going to be really big in protecting the data sets that you use for various functions in artificial intelligence all across the spectrum, not just in the government, not just in the military, but also on the commercial side. So when you think about that, think of that as your intellectual property that's all of your value as a nation. Everything's going to reside in that. And that's one of the things that we're going to have to be very good at protecting. So now if we put that out there, you say, think of these machine, these huge foundational models that are costing hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars to create. Protecting those now is, is very important because they're going to be the foundation for developing our protection and our warfare capabilities. Where cyber comes in is now think about that is who are your warriors to fight in this space? And the answer is it's a digital group. We have to now think about this in a very different way because the adversary is going to attack those things that we just talked about, the, the sets for disinformation, for things to complicate our way of life, to sway our people. All of those things are gonna be attacked by an adversary who wants to do us harm. In our, in our defense, then we have to be prepared to defend all of that. We had a great discussion uh, with both President Bush and Obama on the use of AI in cyber. And people were uncomfortable. Remember, this was 14 years ago. Uh, and many were saying, well, I'm not, you know, how's this going to work? How you, my, our comment was, the adversary is going to use cyber for offense because it will allow the adversary to see the vulnerabilities, to see all the exploit possibilities in a huge way that humans cannot do and nor can they keep up with. So you need the defense side to look at your vulnerabilities, to look at what's going on in the networks and to map that out in a corresponding way. Those digital police on the defense side are going to have to look out for those digital warriors on the offense and be prepared to bring in digital warriors on the defense to defend our country and our allies in this, in this uh, future battle in cyberspace. And industry is hugely important in this. So I think, you know, it's really, I think, great that in DHS now, one of the great players in cyber is Jen Easterly at CISA. She's brilliant. She's now sitting at that uh, nexus between the commercial sector and the government, between what Cyber Command, FBI, DOJ all bring to the table and what the uh, private industry has. But the private industry is our nation. That's, that's our future. So this group has to defend this group. We had a series of discussions on the role of the military mm -hmm. and the intelligence community on defending the nation. And it comes right down to, we have the government to defend our nation and our way of life. Cyber is no different. 
So we have to prepare for that. But in this case, you can see by that very question that you ask, it, it has to be seamless between what the military is doing and then what's going on in the commercial sector. So we have to train different than we've done in the past. We have to think different than we have in the past. And all the things that Secretary Chertoff and Kim brought up about the data, protecting the data, protecting our values and our way of life are gonna be a key part of what cybersecurity plays in that. I think this is, you know, it's a fascinating future. If we were to set aside all the bad things that could happen, think of all the good things that can happen, just in terms of medical. This is huge. We ought not slow down. But given that there are bad people out there, at least a couple, we have to have, and we must be prepared to defend in this way and ensure everything that we set up is curated, has the right values and is set to go and a mechanism to ensure that the data being used by that entity is the correct data set. So that part is going to be part of this whole evolution of how we use AI in the future. You know, if you think about the phenomenal data sets that they're using, trillions of events is what they're going to in the current foundational models. Uh, and uh, trillions of elements there that they will, they will put out. If you think about that, that's more than we probably could take in and, and quickly manage. And on top of that will be all these other capabilities to do it. So it's gonna increase, it's gonna go faster. We need to train our children in the, in the science, technology, engineering, math, and cyber. And I think this is, this is the battle of the future. And the good part is, you know, we're an innovation nation. We have led since the 1960s, the computer age. We can't slow down. We can't let off the gas. Our future economy depends on us doing this right. And I think this is an area where we need to press forward government and industry together to make sure we do it right, but that we also maintain our economic advantage. Yeah, and I think you, you mentioned Clausewitz earlier, just the evolution of warfare. You, we, we introduced the tank and the answer to the tank was a tank. We introduced the airplane, the answer to fighting with airplanes was a, an airplane. Even the aircraft carriers ended up fighting aircraft carriers. And I think it's just, it, it makes absolute sense that we have to be able to fight in the cyber world. S Secretary Churchill. You know, so, uh, so to that point, um, uh, yes, but. In warfare, what it goes back to an earlier question about the integration of uh, people and AI and how we balance those two systems, because it is, yes, both a tank, but we found that tank against tank was good on some casts, but an infantry group that could get in could hurt the tanks. So now you've got combined arms warfare. And we found out that, oh, we needed airplanes to help in the battlefield joint. And so the reality is to defend cyber in the physical space, we're gonna need machines and people to help defend it. And so it's actually that integration and that use of it that goes back to your earlier question. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it's exactly right. So Secretary Chertoff, your group does a lot of work in, in cyber for business, cybersecurity for business. Anything that you would add on to General Alexander's remarks there? No, I mean, I think there has to be integration between government and the private sector, recognizing the government doesn't live on the networks that are operated by private business, you know, for a very good reason. But what's happened more and more is the domain of conflict has become a domain that extends into the private sector. And we need to start to think about how the private sector prepares for that and how the government prepares for that, and even how the law prepares for that. And I'll give you an example. When the Russians invaded Ukraine a year and a half ago, they actually did launch a cyber attack against the Ukrainian government. But the reason it didn't stop the government in its tracks is because previously Ukraine had moved its data, government data, into the cloud being operated by Microsoft outside of its own borders. So that created a resiliency which allowed them to recover very quickly. Uh, and increasingly, as we use the private sector, you had SpaceX, you know, Elon Musk, has used the private sector for satellites, for, for 
intelligence collection for artificial intelligence, are our adversaries going to begin to view the private sector as combatants? Mm -hmm. And will the law change? And how do we then adjust to that, prepare for it, train for it, and also create uh, resilience in the private sector? So I mean, what we're seeing is a blending of what I call domains of conflict to include many things that we used to view as, oh no, that's not warfare, that's the economy, or it's something else, or it's philosophy, or it's culture. Even in the area of disinformation, as I said earlier, you can't really understand the potency of this until you understand that it can be used to undermine trust and the ability to get unity of effort. <clears throat> because if people don't believe in their leaders or they don't believe in the mission, their willingness to sacrifice will be much diminished. So to me, the most important thing is to take a strategic look across all the boundaries of, of conflict and rivalry, to work with the private and public sector in partnership, to recognize there are some areas where I would give the government you know, basically a monopoly on the use of force. But in many areas, the government's gonna to have to be more open to sharing its information and its intelligence with the private sector so that we can raise everybody's capabilities to defend themselves. Absolutely. So you used, again, a, a word that we've been talking about over and over today, uh, trust. Uh, Kim, you first brought it up. If we could go back to you here, how should AI in national security and defense be governed so that we have the appropriate guardrails in place to manage and protect it while not overly constraining its ability to be applied? Yeah, you know, um, first let, let me um, go back to the fundamental point that I think we're all making here uh, is that um, artificial intelligence uh, and the advancements of, of these technologies uh, is a fundamental aspect of um, every aspect of, of human life, including uh, war fighting operations. And we need to be able to leverage AI to the maximum extent uh, to achieve and maintain a competitive advantage in all domains of operation uh, and across the domains of operation because they are so uh, intertwined uh, and uh, interdependent, and particularly when we think about the dependency that every domain of operation has on cyber and the cyber domain. So AI is here to stay and AI is definitely a capability that we want to be able to leverage. Uh, doing so certainly requires us to do all the things that we've talked about and I can't under, uh, underemphasize the points that were made about uh, the importance of the human system in the process and in the activity that we're talking about here. That the human system is highly influenced uh, in terms of the human's interaction uh, with the machine uh, and the ability to maximize and op optimize the interaction that humans have with the machine. So as we're developing these capabilities, uh, really working through how humans will interact with the machine uh, and how humans will respond to the outputs that the systems that are AI fed uh, are gonna give them uh, is a key piece of it. And certainly from a governance standpoint, certain guardrails in terms of verification, validation, test, uh, experimentation, um, uh, and uh, exercises, uh, absolutely key, right? Uh, it's not just uh, US, by the way, international cooperation and international exercises uh, becomes critically important here. Uh, thinking through from a strategic perspective, as Secretary Chertoff has said, in terms of how the AI will be employed and how it will be designed and developed from uh, the early design phases all the way through uh, operational employment uh, and being able to have certain steps in that process where you're interacting with the AI in a continuous manner is all going to be critical pieces of managing uh, the risk associated with AI. You know, we have to take this kind of this back to the cybersecurity uh, comments. Zero trust. Zero trust in the whole philosophy uh, and understanding that you just cannot trust uh, 
any system or any data, you always have to have some method to verify uh, is, is, some, is gonna be a key factor and a key feature uh, now of every aspect of employing these kinds of technologies. Uh, and so that needs to be a part of it is how do we uh, assure the authenticity uh, and uh, verify uh, where this data is coming from, how this data was created uh, and recognize that, you know, that the tampering could occur, that every system is at risk. So uh, how do we um, manage that risk? Where do we see the risk? How do we manage the risk? Fortunately, uh, we were maturing very quickly in our ability to uh, develop um, some governance processes and some governance frameworks and some governance guidance. Uh, again, coming out of the CISA, uh, there's been some great guidance. NIST has developed a risk management framework for AI that was just released earlier this year. That is a great starting point. That's on the heels of last year, the DOD putting out a uh, responsible uh, AI um, pathway. They called it kind of an overarching document on what some of the key factors of um, building out a responsible, trustworthy set of AI is. So we're getting there, you know, and beginning to get some of the practice of how do you build and deploy and test and operate uh, and maintain uh, AI uh, with humans in the loop uh, in a very responsible and coordinated way. And the more um, skilled we become at this and the more practice we become at this and we incorporate some of our other principles, again, zero trust, DevSecOps, rapid iterative deployment. This is gonna allow us to operate with much more assurity uh, and much, and, and, uh, much greater uh, acceleration in terms of our ability to deploy these capabilities uh, to our maximum best use uh, for delivering competitive advantage. Um, I'm going to pose this next question to Secretary Chertoff, um, but but I'd be interested in hearing everyone's thoughts on this uh, because this is a, this is for everybody, right? We have a U.S. national election nearing. Um, Secretary Chertoff, what are your concerns about AI and how it may be used um, for good or ill in the upcoming election, and what U.S. citizens can do to protect themselves and our institutions of democracy? Uh, should AI be sort of inappropriately uh, brought into the election process? Well, I am concerned about the number of aspects of AI being used, particularly by our adversaries, to distort and manipulate the process. Um, one element of AI, of course, is the development of algorithms that use large amounts of data to target individual people with particular messages that will resonate with them in a way that's very emotional. Um, this goes back to the Cambridge Analytica scandal of about seven years ago, where all the data that is scraped off the internet uh, allows the AI to develop a picture of what you individually are most emotional about, worried about, or entranced by. And then to send you crafted messages, either supporting or, or usually attacking a candidate or otherwise misleading you about the election process or even trust in the election itself in order to get you to focus on those messages and go down the rabbit hole deeper and deeper. And then ultimately your trust is eroded because your vision of the world is encapsulated by this picture that you have been drawn into using your own data to hoist you on, on the petard. So that's one set of issues. So bottom line is, so a second set of issues is deep fakes, video simulations that might show a candidate doing and saying things that are horrible and that are completely made up. And then that again can be used by a campaign to attack an adversary. So how do people prepare themselves for this? Well, I think the bottom line is awareness and education. We need to explain to people that the fact that something is coming to you on your social media as you might like this may very well be a calculated effort to influence you. Likewise, with respect to deep fakes or audios, you ought to look for some validation to show that this is the genuine article. <clears throat> for example, watermarking is the idea that videos or audios that are generated 
in their true form have some kind of encrypted badge or encrypted um, indication such that if it doesn't have that, it suggests that you're dealing with something that is fabricated rather than real. So we have to have an awareness of this. We need to educate people about it. And finally, the social media platforms have an obligation to label what they can find out is artificially generated uh, media, like video and audio. Again, not to interfere with freedom of speech. People have a right even to put out fake images. But what we need to do is say, by the way, people, this is a fake image. And that, I think, is not a First Amendment violation. And it's part of the fundamental responsibility of these uh, individual platforms. Yeah, I think deep fakes are something we are clearly not paying enough attention to. At, at South by Southwest last year, there was a, a presentation on deep fakes, and it, it blew me away as to just how accurate and realistic they can all be today. Any other thoughts on the upcoming election from anyone else on the panel? Yeah, I, you know, I agree with Secretary Chertoff. I would add to it that one of the things that Russia has done is try to get two groups to argue against each other as the elections go up. So if you think about things in the South, I can use a case in point what they did in Ukraine. They told the Russian Ukrainian people that ethnic Ukrainian had bayoneted a three-year-old boy and put his body in the uh, front lawn of the parents. Absolutely fake. When you go to the house and the address, they said it wasn't ethnic Russians that lived there. Everything was fake, but they made this sound real and got the ethnic Russians in a, in a huge uproar until that was south. They've done things in our election as well, stimulating anger amongst our population against groups that really impacts the election. So I think AI will only make that worse. And I think this is something we're going to see in, in the 2024 elections, as the secretary said. OK, let's uh, let's wrap this up with a final question. We'll do this sort of like a, a rapid fire, quick answer, because we are at the end of our time here. So for each of you um, and General Kreider, I'll ask you to, to lead off and, and uh, get it going. When we think about AI from a joint all domain war fighting or, or Homeland Security perspective, so what excites you the most and what worries you the most? Sort of rapid fire, what excites you the most, what worries you the most? What excites me the most is the opportunity that we have to really bring uh, er, all of our capability to bear across every single domain uh, in a more coordinated and optimal uh, manner in a way we've never been able to do before. AI can certainly help us do that. Um, I think what worries me the most is that we won't actually take the action that we need to take to get after it. You know, we're in an urgent fight right now. Uh, China is heavily investing in AI and other technologies. And if we don't keep after this and, and take advantage of what the technologies can bring us, uh, bearing in mind all of the challenges and concerns that we raised today, uh, we will slip behind. So we have got to take advantage of it. We've got to optimize what we can do with it. Thank you. Secretary Chertoff. Yeah, well, I, I think, again, what excites me is the possibility of integrating huge amounts of data in a way that, in, that allows us to look across all the domains to be strategic, to understand the collateral impact of what we're doing so that we can intelligently and wisely deploy our resources and capabilities to defend ourselves. What, what worries me is that we will cede too much to artificial intelligence and we will uh, begin to overlook the fact that while intelligence and analysis is one thing, judgment and ethics is something else. And we need to make sure again that a human being is supervising and in the loop if we're gonna take consequential decisions based upon artificial intelligence. And General Alexander. I, you know, I'm I'm excited about what this could mean for the medical community, for our environment, for a whole host of areas where we have huge problems that heretofore we've not been able to solve. AI can really help us in these areas. What I'm worried about is not only what we talked about disinformation, the elections and what can go on there, 
but the use of AI in warfare? And are we as a nation ready to step up and train our military and how to combat such an activity? I think that's the future that worries me the most. Well, thank you. I'm going to throw my own here at the end, my own two cents here. I think what excites me the most is, uh, and General Alexander, you touched on it, medical. I have a son-in-law who's a surgeon who is over the top excited about having an AI surgeon in the operating room with him uh, to help him make the right decisions and, and, uh, and treat the patient better. I'm excited about how this makes uh, humans even better at being humans. What worries me is the general population the education that we need to do to make sure that everybody really understands what's at hand, because you can either embrace it without enough trust, as we've talked about today, or uh, put too many restrictions around it, and we uh, kind of keep it from uh, reaching our fullest potential. So thank you all so much uh, for joining us on this panel, and to everybody that uh, tuned in today. We hope that this was an, an enlightening conversation, an enlightening discussion. And uh, we're going to throw this back to David and the America Future series uh, to continue in the program today.